Hello again. Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about viral DNA replication. And here is the cast of characters that we're going to be looking at today. Very similar to last time when we talked about transcription of DNA templates. The viruses we're going to be looking at today include parvoviruses with single-stranded DNA genomes, hepatitis B virus with gapped double-stranded DNA genomes, and adenoviruses, herpes simplex viruses, polyoma and papilloma viruses with fully double-stranded DNA genomes. And the question we're addressing today is how do we make more of these genomes, which typically occurs later in the infectious cycle, so that new virus particles can be made. Just like for RNA-directed RNA synthesis, there are universal rules for DNA replication. And here, the name would be DNA-dependent or DNA-directed DNA synthesis. And of course, it's catalyzed by DNA-dependent DNA polymerases. Now, once again, we're showing a template with a primer priming DNA synthesis at the 3' hydroxyl. So DNA is synthesized by template-directed incorporation of deoxy-NMPs to the 3' end of the DNA chain. It's always synthesized in a 5 to 3' direction, and it occurs by semi-conservative replication. And that means both strands are copied. If you look at the diagram on the right, here in the middle is a double-stranded DNA. The strands are separated, and each is copied separately. That's semi-conservative replication, as opposed to conservative replication, in which only one strand is copied. Replication always initiates at specific sites on the DNA template, and these are called origins or ORIs. I mentioned these last time. We'll go into a little bit about them today. The enzyme is DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, but that's not enough. As you'll see, you need lots of other proteins to carry out DNA synthesis. And what about a primer? It can be either primer-dependent or primer-independent. Most of the polymerases, all of the polymerases we'll talk about today are primer-dependent polymerases, but there are some out there and other viruses that are not. Here's what the enzyme looks like. On the left, the red structure is the crystal structure of a DNA polymerase with a, a template and product strand in the active site. You can see the, the two beta strands in yellow. Uh, those are the active site or part of the active site of the enzyme. Below the DNA polymerase is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase poliovirus. We talked about a few lectures ago. And there again, you can see the two yellow beta sheets or beta strands, which are part of the active site. And the enzyme looks like a right hand, just like the RNA polymerases. The thumb and the fingers domain and the palm is the active site. The way that triphosphates are added is very much like for RNA synthesis. And that's shown on the right again, where the template is shown in a three to five prime direction and bases are added to form the daughter strand. And the T base is being added here. It's added as an triphosphate with three phosphates. And just as in the RNA polymerases, uh, two aspartate residues hold magnesium ions in place to catalyze uh, the attack that removes two of the three phosphates and allows the phosphodiester bond to form, adding the new base to the growing chain. Viral DNA replication always requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. We said this last time, and that's why transcription has to occur first upon infection. Once the template is ready, that is, it's made double-stranded. Sometimes it's just one viral protein, as you will see for our simple paradigm, SV40. Other viruses make many proteins. The bigger the genome, the more viral proteins are made that are involved in DNA synthesis. But no virus encodes all of the proteins required for replication. They need something from the host. And so even the pox viruses that do it in the cytoplasm need something from the host. How about the DNA polymerase? 
way back when we talked about viral genomes, we talked about double-stranded DNA viral genomes. The small ones utilize the DNA polymerase of the host. These small DNA viruses, again, they don't encode anywhere near an entire replication system. They don't encode the DNA polymerase for sure. They typically encode proteins that I like to say orchestrate the host. They attract the DNA synthesis machinery of the host to, to replicate their genomes. And these include the papillomaviruses, the polyomaviruses, and the parvoviruses. And we'll talk about these in some detail. The larger DNA viruses, as I say, encode most, but not all, of their replication systems, herpes viruses, adenoviruses, and poxviruses. Aside from the DNA polymerase, there are other proteins that are involved in DNA replication. These include origin-binding proteins, helicases, exonucleases, and enzymes of nucleic acid metabolism to make the products, the triphosphates that are going to be used to build DNA, like thymidine kinase, ribonucleotide reductase, DUTPase, and much, much more. Our first question is, which statement about viral DNA synthesis is not correct? A, large DNA viruses encode many proteins involved in DNA synthesis. B, small DNA viruses encode at least one protein involved in DNA synthesis. C, viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection because it requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. D, some viruses encode all proteins needed for DNA replication. The incorrect answer is D. No virus encodes all proteins needed for DNA replication. Everything else is right. Large viruses encode many. Small viruses encode at least one. And this is a good point. Viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection because it requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. We talked about that last time, how, how you come about delaying viral DNA synthesis by these transcriptional control programs. And the reason is that you want to delay it uh, until you have uh, the viral protein that you need or proteins to drive the process. As you know already, viral DNAs have many different kinds of structures. So we're going to talk about how you would replicate these different structures today. These include the uh, single-stranded adenovirus-associated viruses or parvoviruses, the double-stranded DNA circles, and linear genomes of adenoviruses and herpes viruses, and the weird double-stranded linear genome of the pox viruses with their terminal loops. And we're going to talk today about origins of replication. You can see some of them are noted here on these genomes as ORI, and they're viral origin binding proteins. They're going to be cellular replication proteins that are involved and viral replication proteins. In general, we talk about two mechanisms of DNA, of double-stranded DNA synthesis. And the one on the left is called a replication fork. We find this in DNA replication of papillomaviruses, polyomaviruses, herpes viruses, and the proviruses of retroviruses, which are integrated into our DNA. And that tells you that our DNA replicates by replication forks. This synthesis is primed by RNA, and you can see the RNA is shown in green. So the synthesis is occurring on both strands, the top strand and the bottom strand. And of course, it's going in different directions as dictated by having to read the template in a three to five prime direction and synthesizing in a five to three prime direction. So that replication fork mechanism is primed by RNA. On the right is the other mechanism called strand displacement, which we'll see in adenoviruses, parvoviruses, and poxviruses. This is never RNA primed, but it is primed in some cases by a protein and in some cases by a DNA hairpin. I'll tell you all about that in a moment. The key problem that we have to solve in DNA replication is the five prime end problem, and that's illustrated here. 
On the top, we have a DNA template. We synthesize RNA primers. So this is going to be a kind of replication that requires RNA primers. The DNA polymerase then uses the primers to initiate DNA replication or synthesis, and that's shown in red. You fill in the gaps between primers. You then have to remove the RNA primers because you can't have RNA DNA. It has to be all DNA. Primers are removed. The remaining gaps are elongated. Then the pieces are ligated together. But look, at the left end, you have a gap. You took away a primer, now you have a gap, and there's no way to fill it in because there isn't a primer. Now what? We have it solved. You'll see. Let's start with SV40. Most of what we know about DNA replication comes from studying SV40, this little double-stranded circular DNA virus. Now, the genome is double-stranded and circular. As you can see on the right, for SV40, 5,000 bases has a single origin of replication. And that is where DNA replication initiates, and it initiates away from the origin in two directions. And let's look at that. On the left, you see on uh, panel B, our, our DNA, we've just taken a small bit of it for clarity, and the origin is there. DNA replication is occurring in both directions from the origin on the top strand and the bottom strand. And as the DNA is replicated, you get the formation of a bubble and a fork. That's where the term replication fork comes from because it looks sort of like a fork, except, of course, it doesn't have any of the tines of a fork that you eat with. It's kind of like the fork in the road, right? So replication is occurring on both strands. And this uh, picture above is an electron micrograph of replicating SV40 DNA molecules in vitro in a test tube. And it's a fragment of DNA on the left. In, pan in the very first panel, you can see a tiny replication bubble has just formed at the origin. It's getting bigger in the second panel and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. This experiment was part of the proof that replication is bidirectional via a replication fork in SV40. We didn't know this. We knew it by doing these experiments with this virus. So how does this work? Here's a little more detailed picture of this replication fork, the bidirectional. So we say that SV40 DNA replication is semi-discontinuous from a bidirectional origin. So the bidirectional origin, I think, is pretty simple because here's the origin in the middle, and the DNA synthesis occurs on the top strand to the left and on the bottom strand to the right. All right, so it's bidirectional. Well, what is semi-discontinuous? Well, you can see here that one strand on the top strand, if you will, one of the newly synthesized strands in red is made continuously. The other one is made in pieces, primed with RNA. They're all primed with RNA, but so that's where the semi-discontinuous comes from because uh, two of the strands are continuous and two are discontinuous. And the discontinuous has to happen, or the discontinuity, if you will, uh, because uh, as this replication bubble is forming, you can synthesize in a five to three prime direction from the origin. But as the, uh, the other strand replicates on the bottom, you now expose more single-stranded template as the double strands are denatured. And the only way you can fill these in or, or replicate them is to make uh, RNA primers and make small pieces. As if you imagine as this strand uh, grows, a little bit of single-stranded DNA is exposed. So a primer is put down, it's filled in, and so forth. You can't put a primer all the way at the end because you would have to wait until the whole strand were exposed by this bottom-moving uh, replicating strand, and that simply doesn't happen. So it's discontinuous. It's made in pieces with RNA primers uh, that are then used to prime DNA synthesis, these orange DNA strands are indicating that. And then, of course, the RNA primers are removed and the gaps are filled in and the DNA pieces are ligated together to make one daughter strand. 
this is a linear DNA at, at the bottom that's being replicated, and it just emphasizes the end problem. There's a gap at either end of a linear DNA from removal of the RNA primer. Because these molecules are circular, the S340 molecules, there's no end problem because there are no ends, right? So the DNA is just simply synthesized all around until the complete circle is made and then the beginning and the end strands join together. And so there's no end problem. That's the solution to an end problem, make a circular genome. Now this happens in a very interesting way, this replication of SV40, that involves large T antigen. Remember from last time, large T is the first protein. It's an early protein of SV40 that's made early after the DNA gets into cells. It's needed in good quantities to drive DNA synthesis. And then only when DNA synthesis occurs do you start making the late structural proteins. So how does large T antigen drive DNA synthesis? This is where I talk about orchestrating the host. Large T orchestrates the host. So large T is shown in these oblong brown um, ways. These are each a monomer of large T. These bind to specific sequences at the origin of SV40 replication. And in fact, it binds as hexamers. You can see there are two hexamers here in the second line. And what that binding does is two very important things. First, it denatures the origin. So the origin, of course, is double-stranded, but has to be separated so the two strands can be replicated by DNA polymerase. So the large T's function, one of them, is to denature the origin of replication. The next thing it does, and it denatures it in an ATP-dependent fashion. That's where all these orange um, or yellow ovals are. The other thing that T antigen does is it binds a protein called RPA, which binds to the single-stranded DNAs that have been made by large T binding, and that keeps them single-stranded. All right, so two functions. LT binds the origin, denatures it, and recruits a second protein, RPA, that binds the single-stranded DNA. All right, so the next uh, process here is that polymerases are recruited by virtue of RPA being bound, and one of the polymerases is called Paul alpha it's a primase. It's the one that's going to make the RNA primers, and it can also make short DNA fragments. So that's occurring in the second step. Some other additional proteins uh, come in, and eventually polymerase epsilon is recruited in, which will make the longer uh, DNA strands, either on the it's continuous strand or on the discontinuous strand. There are a lot of other proteins that come into this, uh, that are involved in DNA synthesis. We don't need to be concerned with that very much. The, the point I want you to remember is first that large T starts this whole process. This lone viral DNA comes in the nucleus. What's the chance it's going to be replicated by a cellular DNA polymerase when there's so much more cellular DNA in the nucleus? The key is large T and getting enough large T to recruit these RPA proteins and eventually the first uh, polymerases to the template. That's what I mean by orchestrating the host. This single protein of SV40 brings the entire cellular DNA replication machinery to the viral genome. It's, it's, it's just amazing. And so here at the bottom, you see the synthesis of the leading, the leading strands on, on both uh, the top and the bottom DNA. This continues uh, to make leading and lagging strands. So here we have leading strands, those are the ones that are made continuously, and then the lagging strands are made as single strands are exposed, and you put down an RNA primer, and then you synthesize DNA. You can sort of see that here. The RNA primer is green, and the DNA is, is two colors of red. Uh, the, the RNA eventually will be removed by RNA-SH, which is an enzyme that removes RNA when it's part of an RNA-DNA hybrid, and that's how the primers are. Uh, and then a DNA ligase will, the FEN1 will fill in the gaps and the DNA ligase will then seal the, the bonds and you have complete DNA strands. And this happens continuously as the replication fork gets bigger and bigger, single-stranded DNA is exposed by the action of these RPAs, the, the large Ts remain on there, and you eventually replicate the entire genome. Now, when you do this with a closed circular template, you start DNA synthesis at the origin of replication at the top here. And here we're showing the two strands being made. 
eventually that unwinding of the template causes the rest of the molecule to become overwound. Kind of like when you're studying, you get overwound. And so you have to take care of that stress. You have to relax this DNA molecule. And that's done by enzymes called topoisomerases. So topoisomerase one or two are host enzymes that make nicks in this DNA as it's replicating, and it relaxes. It cleaves one strand, and you make it relaxed. And then, you know, the, the natration continues. It gets overwound again, and the topos nick it again. So that's good. Otherwise, if this became overwound, eventually the polymerase would stop because it could not get into the over, overwound region. Then in the end, when you're finished replicating the whole molecule, you have two full-length molecules, actually four, right? Because you had two originally, and then you duplicated each one. So now you have four molecules, and they're all they're joined together. It's not really clear in this picture on the bottom because they're also twisted. But just think of two circles. Make a circle with your thumb and forefinger and then of one hand, and then with the other one, do the same thing. And they're linked, like two circles linked together. And you can't move them apart. So what you have to do is cleave both strands. And that's done by topoisomerase. So now you can release both double-stranded DNA circles. That's also called terminal resolution. I'll use that term elsewhere today. And it's an energy-dependent reaction. So when you have these circular DNAs and you replicate them, you need these enzymes to relax the overwound regions, and to carry out terminal resolution of the two products. Our next question, the SV40 genome is a circular, double-stranded DNA. Which statement about its replication is correct? A, viral T antigen binds and unwinds the ORI. B, replication is bidirectional from a single ORI. C, the five prime end problem is solved. D, has leading and lagging strand synthesis. E, all of the above. The answer is E. All this is right. The antigen binds and unwinds the origin. It's bidirectional replication. The five prime end problem is solved because they're circles, so there's no end. They get leading and lagging strand synthesis. It's all correct. Let's look at parvoviruses. These small DNA viruses, they have a single stranded DNA genome. And this genome encodes just two proteins, the rep and the cap. The cap, as you might guess, encodes the capsid protein, single capsid protein. These are T equals one viruses, one protein. Well, you can tell me how many subunits that would be to make a small capsid, right? 60. And then we have the rep ORF. This is kind of like the T antigen for SV40. This will orchestrate the host's DNA synthesis machinery. Now, this genome replicates a little bit differently. It's mostly single-stranded, but the ends form these TRs. That stands for terminal repeats. These are base-paired sequences that form because there's complementarity in the sequences. Here's the very three-prime end of the genome, you, and that would correspond to the origin of replication. You can see that it is complementary to a sequence not too far upstream from it. And so you form these T structures, which are base paired structures. That's the primer for DNA synthesis built into the genome. The terminal repeat is the primer. And as you will see, it's going to solve the end problem in replication. Even though these molecules are not circular, it doesn't have an end problem. So how do these molecules replicate? It's a little small here, but let's go through it. So the top uh, is our linear molecules with the, with the, Terminal repeats taken away, so you can see uh, the the way these form. There's A and its complement A prime, all right. So those would base pair, as you can see there, and form a, a terminal repeat on the left. And the same thing would happen on the right. These are called inverted terminal repeats, and that's because they're repeated sequences and they're inverted. A B C A B C, A prime B prime C prime. Okay, so we have a molecule with the terminal hairpins. When this comes into the nucleus, the cell looks at it and says, single-stranded DNA, not good, and it fixes it. Fills in the second strand, and it uses the three-prime hydroxyl of the left terminal repeat as a primer. Okay, so now we have 
a weird molecule, which is double-stranded DNA with a terminal hairpin on the left end. It's all covalently joined. The viral protein has to be made now. Rep 7868. It's it's that protein encoded on the left end right here. There there are a couple of proteins encoded in there. One of them is called Rep 7868. And this uh, protein has a couple of functions. One is it's going to nick the DNA template at the bottom strand, right where that black arrow is. It says site of sequence specific nick. So now we have a, a nick right there. The three prime end at that nick, which will be the blue end, is going to be a primer for DNA synthesis. And this rep, what's doing that, the rep is recruiting the the host cell DNA polymerase to start elongating. And so it will copy the little blue hairpin and, and stretch it out so you get it copied. So that's shown in this next step between after four, I guess. So that's called elongating from the nick. So the polymerase will copy the blue and you make a red strand and it's complementary and it's stretched out. There's no longer an ability to form a hairpin because it's double-stranded. So now you have this longer than virus genome replication intermediate. The ends form two hairpins. You can see at the left end here. You now have two three prime ends. You get reinitiation of synthesis from the three prime hydroxyl on the red strand, as you can see here. And that's again by host polymerases recruited by this rep 7868 protein. And that synthesis continues, it displaces the top strand, that's displacement synthesis, which we talked about earlier briefly. And now you have, let's see, we're gonna have a double stranded molecule with a terminal hairpin, that's this one at the bottom here. And the top strand, which is displaced, is shown here with blue left end and red rest of the genome. That's called genomic DNA. That's now a replicated genome. And then you have a double-stranded form, which is exactly the same as the one in step two. So this goes back and goes through this whole process again. You make more genomes, and you just keep doing this over and over again. There's no end problem because the terminal repeats assure that you don't lose any sequence. Because the way this uh, priming and extension occurs, you get more sequences inserted at the end, and they're, they're eventually forming the hairpins. So this is continuous replication. You don't need to do any discontinuous replication here because it's by strand displacement. You don't need any RNA primers. The, the three prime hydroxyl of the genome, the, the terminal repeats serve as a primer. Um, it uses the terminal repeat to self prime, so you don't need the polymerase alpha, which makes the primers. It does need other proteins, including a, a delta polymerase and, and other cellular proteins. And as I said, the Rep7868 are required for making that initial NIC, recruiting the polymerase, and it's also an unwinding protein. So there's no replication fork. Replication is by strand displacement, and the genome primes itself. So that's a very clever solution to the 5 prime end problem. Moving bigger genomes, adenovirus, double-stranded DNA, 35,000 base pairs in length, wrapped up inside the icosahedral capsid. As you can see here, it's, it's bound to a variety of, of proteins. These, these genomes have origins at both ends. And again, an origin simply means that's where DNA synthesis occurs. And so on the parvovirus genome, uh, the origin's at the end of the genome. So right there at that three prime hydroxyl, that's where DNA synthesis begins. So the three prime ends are the, are the origins. Here, it's both ends. That's where DNA synthesis is gonna begin. And it occurs by strand displacement. Of course, it's semi-conservative. This uh, synthesis is protein primed, and as you will see, that's how we get around the end problem. So we start at the top here. We have a double-stranded DNA genome, and a there's a DNA polymerase that is encoded in the adenovirus genome. So, of course, you have to synthesize this. And remember, we first make immediate early proteins, and then the early proteins include the DNA polymerase, and this red protein here called terminal protein. It's actually pre-terminal protein. 
This is linked to the polymerase. And the serine of preterminal protein serves as a primer. A C residue is added to the serine when it's when the preterminal protein is together with uh, the DNA poly polymerase at the origin of replication, which is the end, the three prime end of the genome. And that's going to be the primer for DNA synthesis. Polymerase attached to preterminal protein. Serine of that preterminal is, is linked to a C. That's going to base pair with the last G on the viral DNA, and that's the primer for DNA synthesis. So you're priming at the very end of the genome. You're not going to lose any sequence. So let's extend now the C by the polymerase activity. Uh, that's shown here in step two. You got you have some red DNA being made. That's a copying of the of the bottom strand of DNA. The top strand is being displaced. This is strand displacement. The virus encodes a DNA binding protein. That's the yellow spheres. It's binding this single stranded DNA to keep it single stranded. Eventually, it's completely displaced, and you have a new double stranded DNA made. It's red and blue. That can go back and be replicated again and again and again by the same mechanism. The polymerase binds to the 3 prime end with the preterminal protein, and the replication is primed with the C again. What about the other strand? That is coated with DNA binding proteins, but the ends are forming a double-stranded structure that looks very much like the end of the viral DNA. And that's because the ends of the viral genome have inverted terminal repeats. And they're complementary, so they can base pair. This looks just like the end of a genome to the polymerase, so the polymerase attaches to it and starts to replicate it. It will, of course, uh, add uh, a serine C to the PTP. Just the C is added, of course. And that will start priming at the three prime end of this hairpin. And so synthesis is beginning on the bottom strand. And uh, it extends, and the polymerase will slowly knock off these single-stranded DNA binding proteins and make another double strand. So that can feed back into the pathway as well. Bottom line is both strands are replicated. One strand is replicated, and the other by is displaced and also replicated because it forms these terminal structures, or panhandles, you could call them, that look like the ends of the DNA uh, and are recognized by the polymerase because the polymerase recognizes the end as an origin of replication and begins the uh, priming with the C on the preterminal protein. The adenoviral single-stranded DNA binding protein is quite interesting. That's the one that coats the single strands as they are displaced. So here is a polymerase making newly synthesized DNA on the bottom strand. It's moving through and the a single-stranded DNA binding protein binds, as the name indicates, single-stranded DNA to keep it single-stranded. And these uh, molecules simply fit in as the polymerase moves through the duplex. And this molecule is shown here sort of like a plow shape, and it's on the left there is the actual structure in three dimensions of the protein. You can see it's got an extended end that is thought to fit into the DNA helix and help to denature it. Our next question, how is DNA replication of parvovirus and adenovirus similar? A, they both require protein-linked primers. B, replication occurs by strand displacement. C, DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. D, a replication fork occurs in both or none of the above. Parvovirus and adenovirus. All right, so the similarity, the answer here, of course, is replication occurs by strand displacement. Parvoviruses don't need protein-linked primers. All this DNA synthesis occurs in the nucleus, by the way. They're both strand displacement, so there's no replication fork. So B is the correct answer. Moving even bigger herpes simplex viruses with even bigger double-stranded DNA genomes. These uh, double-stranded DNAs are packaged in an icosahedral capsid. So it is a nucleocapsid because it's a substructure. It's within an envelope. 
and it's icosahedral. Remember, it has a portal at one five-fold axis through which the DNA comes out when this capsid docks on the nuclear pore. The envelope fuses at the plasma membrane, releasing the capsid along with the proteins inside the tegument area, including that VP16, which is needed for transcription. But here we're concerned with DNA replication. This genome has three origins of replication, ORI L, S, and S. Again, two S's and one L. Uh, and as you will see, the DNA enters the nucleus as a linear molecule. It's converted to a circle and replicates by a rolling circle mechanism. And this virus encodes quite a few uh, proteins that are involved in DNA replication. Aside from the polymerase, that's the name of the gene that encodes the polymerase. It encodes a single-stranded DNA binding protein, very much like the adenovirus we just talked about, an origin binding protein, like all the viruses, a processivity protein that makes uh, the polymerase keep going and not fall off, and uh, enzymes that make the primers for DNA synthesis. So let's see how this works. DNA comes into the nucleus as a double-stranded linear molecule. There is a cell ligase called XRCC4 that makes a circle out of this. It just takes the two ends and covalently links them. So now we have a double-stranded circular DNA genome. And this happens again in the nucleus. And again, it's host proteins that carry out this circularization. So I guess you can imagine already how the end problem is solved, right? In uh, adenovirus, we just saw it's, it's solved because you use a primer that is a protein. So when it's removed, you're not losing any sequence. Here, it's a circle, just like SV40. So what is rolling circle replication? It's just as the name says. You start with a double-stranded circle. You have to make a nick to generate a three-prime end so that you can start synthesizing DNA. You can't just copy a double-stranded circle without a nick or a gap. And then the polymerase will start elongating at the three-prime end. That's the red sequence, newly synthesized DNA. As that is made, it displaces the top strand, and that's shown coming off here. And this strand keeps going around in continuous fashion. So you could imagine this is a rolling circle, right? And as this new strand is made, it's pushing off the top strand, as you can see here. And once enough of that top strand is exposed, you can start doing discontinuous DNA synthesis. So when a little bit is exposed, you lay down a primer, you make a piece, then another primer, you make another piece, etc. That's why it's discontinuous. And this keeps going and going and going till you get concatomers, which means genome length DNA molecules all joined together because the circle is just rolling and rolling and rolling. And you're copying off both strands. The circle, the inner circle remains intact, so it can just be a template over and over and over again. And then the other strand is copied as it comes off. And so there's no end problem. Maybe the, the last end, the last primer that you put on when you're done after peeling off hundreds and hundreds of molecules, you know, it's kind of like a, a roll of toilet paper, if I may, here, except it's not all stored up. It's made as you pull it off. But each of these is a sheet, and it's going to be packaged into the particle as a sheet or a genome like this, you'll see later. So rolling circle replication, no end problem. And in our last subject for today is pox virus. How do we replicate this big double-stranded DNA genome where the ends are terminally joined? Because you may think, well, you know, adenovirus has a double-stranded DNA and it, it primes at the end with a protein, and you, you have, but you have to separate the ends. You can't do that here because it's covalently joined. And herpes virus is made into a circle, but you can't make a circle here because the ends, there's no end to ligate. So we'll solve that problem. And of course, this is the one virus we talk about that replicates in the cytoplasm. All the other viruses replicate in the nucleus. So pox viruses have to encode most of the DNA replication machinery, but not all. They do get something still from the host. So here's an, an experiment which shows you where the DNA is replicating in the cyto cytoplasm of the host cell. And we call these DNA factories. So here on the left is a, a cell uh, that is infected with a pox virus. It's stained with 
a dye called DAPI that stains DNA. And so the big blue da- uh, blob in the middle is the cell nucleus. And the cytoplasm has got some, uh, some blue stain as well. In particular, you can see these big blue dots at the lower left. Middle panel is stained with an antibody to the pox virus DNA binding protein. Just like the DNA binding proteins we've talked about of adenovirus, it binds single-stranded DNA. And you can see that's in the cytoplasm, not in the nucleus. Okay, makes sense, the red. And if you merge the blue and the red, you can see that the DNA binding protein is overlapping with the DNA stain in the cytoplasm. So that's where the virus is replicating in these, uh, what are called DNA factories in the cytoplasm. And how does it work? This is the latest model for DNA vac, uh, pox, pox virus or vaccinia virus, which is a pox virus DNA replication. A lot of viral proteins involved, at least 15. But again, not everything that's needed. And it's thought to, to begin at an origin at one of the two ends. So the, this is the genome. It's, it's all, it's all uh, base paired, essentially. It's double-stranded, but the ends are joined. So it's a genome monomer, for example. And there seems to be an origin of replication uh, at one of these ends, and uh, replication simply begins there. Uh, we don't know exactly how the DNA replication machinery is attracted to it, but primers are put down, RNA primers, uh, and then DNA synthesis occurs. And it can be continuous uh, through one strand. There, there are two primers shown here, but you really don't need that. You could just lay down one primer and go all around the circle. So that would give you a dimer, which would be something like in the middle here. And now you have... Uh, two strands of DNA in what is almost a double-stranded circle. And so you have to do con- resolution of these concatenars. okay? You have to somehow break each of them, break double strands, if you will, and separate the two monomers. And now you have the original strand and a replicated strand, and um, that will go over, and they will each go on and be replicated in the same way. And, of course, there's no end problem because it's essentially a circle, and that's the solution to that problem for this virus. Our last question today, what makes pox virus DNA replication different from all of the other viruses we discussed today? A, the complete replication machinery is encoded by the viral genome. B, DNA synthesis occurs in the nucleus. C, DNA synthesis occurs by strand displacement. D, none of the above. The answer is none of the above. The complete machinery is not encoded by the genome. Much of it is, but not all of it. This synthesis doesn't occur in the nucleus. Cytosolic, cytoplasmic, it doesn't occur by strand displacement. It's just continuous replication around a circle, and uh, so it's none of the above. I've been talking a lot about viral origins of replication on each of these viral genomes, the SV40, parvovirus, adenovirus, herpes virus, and they're labeled on all of these figures. And I told you that that's where DNA synthesis begins, but they have some other features. Uh, They are typically AT-rich segments of of DNA that are recognized by viral origin recognition proteins. And again, these viral recognition proteins recruit the DNA synthesis machinery, whether it be host for the smaller viruses or viral for the bigger viruses that have their own polymerase. These origins help recruit origin recognition proteins. They're AT-rich because that's easy to denature as opposed to GC-rich, which would be harder. And so the DNA replication machines, multi-proteins, assemble at these origins, as I showed you for SV40. Didn't show you in much detail for the other viruses, but it's a similar idea. And some can have one origin, other viruses have multiple, and for viruses like herpes viruses, the multiple origins seem to serve uh, functions during different kinds of replication. And these viruses establish latent infections in us where there is either no or low DNA replication or very high DNA replication, and these origins can have one or the other function. We'll talk about that later. And for adeno, there's an origin at each end. That's why it has two of them. Our, our chromosomes, by the way, have many, many, many origins. Otherwise, it would take forever to replicate them. This is what some of these origins look like. Here's SV40. The yellow is, is the sequence bound by the origin recognition proteins. 
So you can see SV40, there's the core origin. Uh, there are large T binding sites there and, and to the right as well. Same thing for herpes simplex virus, one of the origins. OREL has these yellow sequences, which are bound by ORI proteins. Same thing for adenovirus. Origin recognition protein, in this case, is the terminal protein uh, that then recruits the polymerase. We also have AT-rich sequences in all of these uh, origins that helps them to denature more easily uh, by the origin binding proteins. And then, interestingly, these uh, origins are often very close to promoters. Now, you can't see that on the SV40 origin, uh, but uh, you can see there are binding sites for transcriptional regulators like SP1. There's an enhancer here. That's for the SV40 promoter. Here, there are two herpes virus promoters going in different directions away from the origin. And, and for the adenovirus, you see binding sites for transcription factors as well, NF1 and OCT1. So there's a promoter not too far from here. Promoters and origin seem to be very close to one another. So somehow uh, the the... Transcriptional activity uh, is linked to DNA replication. These uh, viral origin recognition proteins that we've talked about include uh, polyomavirus T antigens, large T or T antigens that bind specifically to the origin, uh, which you can see here. That's the red protein. Uh, the, the parvovirus Rep 6878 is in red as well, and that's a, uh, a protein that binds to the origin. It nicks, and it also is involved in terminal resolution, which we didn't talk about. The preterminal protein of adenovirus is the origin binding. It binds to each uh, end of the adenovirus DNA and recruits the polymerase to the genome. And then there's a herpes virus protein called UL9 that is shown here in red. It, it binds to the origin and also recruits um, the DNA polymerase. Complex. So these origin recognition proteins uh, bind the origin, they help denature it, and they recruit, if necessary, and they help recruit DNA synthesis machinery. Here's a, a close look at the large T antigen of SV40. This is a protein we will revisit. It's quite interesting, it has lots of functions. It's one of the it's been called the most studied protein on Earth. And here is the linear representation of the protein sequence. It's 708 amino acids long. And different functional domains are shown on the protein. Uh, first of all, it's a, it's a species-specific DNA binding protein or origin binding protein. That means that the, S, that the T antigen of a SV40, which is a monkey virus, will not participate in DNA synthesis in a mouse cell, for example. That's what we mean by species-specific. Uh, so pre-initiation complexes don't form in the wrong species. Large T of SV40 will not uh, allow interaction with polymerase, DNA polymerase alpha primase, in the wrong species. And um, that's due to differences in sequences. In particular, there's some sequences here at the, at the end involved in host range and at the end terminus, there are sequences that interact with Paul alpha, and, and that in particular is, is uh, going to be different in different species. So the SV40 large T will interact with Paul alpha from a monkey cell, but not from a mouse cell. There's some other sequences here that are quite interesting. Here's the helicase domain, of course, and the ATPase is part of the helicase. That's important for unwinding the origin. Here's the sequence for binding the origin. So this part of the protein specifically binds uh, to the origin as well. And one of the important other aspects of this is that the protein binds and sequesters cell cycle regulators. And that includes this uh, sequence here, which binds to Paul alpha. By the way, there are two parts here that bind to Paul alpha. And also a protein called P53 and a protein called RB. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a moment. But then if, here you see NLS, nuclear localization signal, a very short amino acid sequence that allows this protein to get in the nucleus after being made in the cytoplasm. Because after all, that's where it needs to be to start 
DNA synthesis. All right, what's what's this about binding and sequestering cell cycle regulators and causing cells to enter S phase? Well, it turns out that most of the cells in our body do not divide, or if they do, they do it pretty rarely. Okay, there's some that replicate a lot, like our gut epithelium turns over every couple of days, but most of our cells don't replicate, and unless you're, say, an athlete and you're training and you're building muscles, so then you're replicating cells. But the rest of us uh, who sit around, uh, even if we think a lot, our neurons don't replicate. Uh, they're, they're quiescent. And in general, viruses do not replicate well in quiescent cells because quiescent cells aren't replicating their own DNA, so they don't have the replication proteins made. There's no point in having a DNA polymerase around if you're not going to use it. It's turned off. The gene's turned off, and the polymerase eventually goes away. So smaller viruses that do not encode most of the DNA synthesis apparatus, they have to turn on the synthesis of these proteins in the cell. They have to induce host replication proteins. And as you might guess, this is done by viral proteins that are early gene products. You have to make these early to start the cell dividing. Otherwise, the virus can't replicate its DNA. And that's what T antigen does and what E1 proteins of adenovirus do. They start DNA synthesis. If the virus gets into a cell that's not dividing, these proteins will make it divide. Pretty amazing, I think. So let's see how this works. First, we have a look at the cell cycle. 24 hour roughly for most cells. You have a point where mitosis occurs. Of course, the cells divide. You start with one and you make two. But most of the cycle is involved with cell growth, G1, uh, the, the replication of DNA, and then eventually the splitting of the cell. So you make a bigger cell, you, you double the DNA content, and then you can make a new cell. All right, that's about a 24-hour period. There is a restriction point in G1 where the cell senses the environment and says, should we be dividing? Is there enough nutrient around? And there are receptors on the cell surface that govern this, which we'll talk about later when we talk about uh, viruses causing cancer. If there aren't enough nutrients around, the cell cycle will stop here. It will not uh, go into the DNA replication. It won't go into mitosis. This restriction point is controlled by a protein called RB, which we saw last time. RB was originally found as a protein that is missing in kids who develop tumors of the eye called retinoblastomas. I think these kids are, are missing the gene. And as a consequence, um, if you don't have RB, the cells just keep dividing and dividing. So the retinal cells keep dividing, and eventually they become tumors because you're not supposed to divide all the time. That leads to mutations, and if you get mutations in enough genes in the cell, maybe a dozen or so different genes, then you become a tumor. So dividing endlessly, that's being immortal, essentially. That's transformed, as we'll see. And having no RB protein causes you the cell to keep dividing. Uh, and so RB is called the tumor suppressor gene because its presence keeps cells uh, from dividing. So we say RB controls entry into S, very important protein. So what about the viruses? What do they do with this protein? Well, do you remember from last time? Well, probably you don't, but I'll tell you. I find this so exciting. Uh, RB is, is complexed to the E2F family of transcription factors. So here's RB in gold, and in a cell that is not dividing, RB is bound to E2F. E2F binds to the promoter region of genes in cells that are needed for the cell cycle. Okay, DNA synthesis and passing through the cell cycle. So you can imagine this is a promoter for multiple genes involved in DNA synthesis, cell growth, everything you need to undergo mitosis. So most of our cells that are quiescent, RB is bound to E2F. So E2F turns out to be a really important prom uh, promoter binding protein for controlling cell division. So here we have RB bound. And remember from yesterday, 
the presence of RB recruits histone deacetylases, which take acetyls off the histones on the DNA, which are not shown here, and that inhibits transcription because it makes the DNA wrap tightly around the histones. So the presence of RB is on this E2F factor inhibits cell division because it blocks the promoters that drive genes that are needed for cell division, DNA synthesis, etc. All right. So RB is why most of our cells do not divide. Now, sometimes a cell has to divide in us, right? As I said, if you're working out and building muscle, you have to divide muscle cells. Or if your epithelium has to divide, if you have a wound and cells have to divide and so forth. So there's a way to get RB off this complex, and that's to phosphorylate it. So there are actually cell cycle-specific kinases that will phosphorylate RB. It pops off of E2F. E2F can now bind these promoters, and, and there's no histone deacetylase is recruited because there's no RB and the promoters are active, you now make all the proteins you need to go through the cell cycle. You make DNA, and you divide the cells in two and so forth. So the viruses simply tap into this. Large T antigen of SV40, adenovirus E1A, or equivalent proteins from human papillomaviruses, E7, they bind RB, and they bump it off E2F. So they don't cause phosphorylation of RB like the cell does. They simply bind it. And that frees up E2F, and the cell will start making proteins needed for cell division, and that includes DNA polymerases and the accessory proteins. And now these viruses can replicate their DNA. SV40, papillomaviruses, adenoviruses, their DNA can be replicated because they need the cell proteins that are involved in cellular DNA synthesis. The bigger viruses don't have an issue with this. Herpes viruses include enough of their own proteins that they don't need to deal with this RBE2F story. Of course, the pox viruses, as I say, they avoid the nuclear bureaucracy entirely because they're in the cytoplasm. So this is how these viruses, SV40, human papillomaviruses, adenovirus, start the cells dividing. When they encounter a cell in us that's not dividing, the first proteins these viruses make, large T antigen, E1A, E7, these go into the nucleus, they bind RB, and they get the cell to start making DNA replication proteins. That's how they deal with cells not dividing most of the time. So uh, these are essential proteins. That's why they're made immediately. Of course, LT uh, of uh, SV40 also is an origin-binding protein. So once it turns on indirectly DNA synthesis by binding RB, it will also bind to viral origins and recruit the DNA synthesis apparatus. And of course, E1A of adenovirus uh, is essential not only for getting the cells to divide, but uh, adenovirus promoters require active E2F, and it doesn't help if RB is bound. So this is another reason why uh, E1A of adenoviruses bind RB to not only get the cells dividing, but to make these E2F proteins available for transcription of viral genes. So this process, this kicking the cells into division, is required for viral DNA replication of these smaller and intermediate viruses in terms of their genome size. As we'll see in a couple of weeks, this also leads to cancer. And, you know, that's a great story that we'll tell later. Next time, we're going to talk about one last enzymatic activity, uh, which is the reverse transcription of the RNA genomes of retroviruses into DNA, which ultimately integrates into the host cell.